So this video has been in the works for quite some time now and I thought that now that I have some free time on my hands, I can actually do a video on iron deficiency anemia. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is here on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at iron deficiency anemia. This is going to be a stepping stone to look at many of the different types and presentations of anemia. And the initial part of this lecture is going to focus more or less on the general features of anemia, then we'll zero in into iron deficiency. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? hit the subscribe button as we're closing on to 8,000 subscribers. Do not forget to hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like and drop a comment. Share the link to the channel to Zambia and beyond. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. So remember that blood is actually a connective tissue that's found in fluid form. It's largely divided into two parts. There is a fluid part which is known as the plasma component, which is going to be consisting of plasma proteins, predominantly the globulins, the fibrinogen, and the albumins, together with other complement proteins and coagulation factors. The majority of it is going to be made up of water, and also you have some electrolytes. Then you have the formed elements, which make up the cellular component of the blood, predominantly the red blood cells, which are also referred to as erythrocytes, white blood cells, which are also called leukocytes, platelets, which are also referred to as thrombocytes or megakaryocytes. Remember, all of these formed elements are going to be synthesized in the bone marrow predominantly, and they're going to be coming from a stem cell, a special type of stem cell that is referred to as a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Remember our definition of a stem cell, which is pretty much a cell that's capable of giving rise to many different cell lineages while it's maintaining its own population. This pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell can divide into one of two important cell lineages. It can divide into the myeloid progenitor cells, and it can also divide into the lymphoid progenitor cells. The lymphoid progenitor cells, cells are going to give rise to the lymphocytes, predominantly our B cells, our T cells, and our natural killer cells. Then all the other cell lineages, including the mast cells, the basophils, the eosinophils, the neutrophils, the monocytes, the red blood cells, and the platelets are going to be coming from the myeloid progenitor cell. Remember, the process of erythropoiesis is going to pretty much take place and result in the synthesis of red blood cells. We approximately make about 10 to the power 12 new red blood cells each and every day, and this is actually in response to hypoxia, which is a decrease in the oxygen partial pressure. So as the oxygen partial pressure decreases, it's going to be detected by the kidneys and it's going to result in the production of a certain hormone that is produced from the peritubular interstitial cells of the kidney, which is known as erythropoietin. This erythropoietin is going to stimulate the proliferation, the differentiation of the cells, as well as the release of the reticulocytes and maturation of the reticulocytes in the bloodstream and also the release of the reticulocytes from the bone marrow. 90% of this erythropoietin is coming from the kidneys, 10% comes from the liver, and sometimes even elsewhere, for example, in the brain. And remember that all the cells that are going to be pretty much found in the bone marrow, the stem cells, are capable of giving rise to different cell lineages. And generally, you have these two committed um, main lineages, the myeloid aspect and the lymphoid aspect. So like I said, the myeloid aspect is going to be giving rise to the megakaryocytes and thrombocytes, the erythrocytes, the mast cells, and the myeloblasts, which will give rise to the basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, which will leave the bloodstream and eventually become macrophages. Then you also have the common lymphoid progenitor cells, which will give rise to the small lymphocytes, which give rise to the B cells, or the B lymphocytes, which can differentiate to form plasma cells that form antibodies, and T lymphocytes. You have different types of T lymphocytes the T helper cells, the T killer cells, and the T suppressor cells. Then you have the non-B nor T cells, which are known as the natural killer cells, or you can refer to them as the large granular lymphocytes. 
So remember that the process of erythropoiesis actually takes through a series of steps. So we first have a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell, which we can refer to as a hematocytoblast, which is eventually going to form a common myeloid progenitor cell. This common myeloid progenitor cell is going to differentiate into a unipotent stem cell, then eventually it's going to form a pronomoblast, which is also commonly referred to as the proerythroblast. We can also call this as a rubriblast. Remember, this is where the synthesis of the certain proteins that are essential for the erythropoiesis has to happen. Then eventually this is going to become a, an early normoblast, which is known as a basophilic normoblast, where now you begin to synthesize hemoglobin. Remember, the synthesis of hemoglobin starts off at the early normoblastic phase, this is also known as the basophilic normoblast because if you look at its cytoplasm, it's basophilic. It will be bluish in color. Eventually, this is going to transform into an intermediate normoblast or polychromatophilic normoblast, which has some hemoglobin beginning to appear. Remember, hemoglobin is going to first appear at this intermediate normoblastic stage. You're going to be having these patches of this uh, bluish patches as well as pinkish patches in the cytoplasm because hemoglobin is appearing. Then you have the late normoblast or the orthochromic normoblast, which still has a nucleus at this point, and most of the hemoglobin has been formed, it has filled up the cell, and it's nice and pink. And then eventually the nucleus is extruded, then it becomes a reticulocyte, which just has this reticular network in the cytoplasm, and it has all the hemoglobin. This reticulocyte is then released into the bloodstream, then it takes roughly about one to two days for it to mature into a mature red blood cell. So here is a picture of the synthesis. You have the proerythroblast, the basophilic erythroblast, which is also known as the early normoblast, the polychromatophilic erythroblast, which is known as the intermediate normoblast, and the orthochromic erythroblast, which is known as the late normoblast. Then you have the reticulocyte and the erythrocytes. So from the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell to about the reticulocyte stage, it takes about five days then the reticulocyte gets released into the bloodstream and then it takes about one to two days for it to develop and become a mature red blood cell in the peripheral circulation. And remember that the reticulocytes are going to be accounting for 1% of the total circulating red blood cells. So it means if you count 10 red blood cells, one of them is going to be a reticulocyte. Generally, the reticulocyte count helps us because it helps us give us an idea of whether the bone marrow is functioning or not. In certain conditions, we do expect the bone marrow to respond, especially if someone has low red blood cells, we do expect it to respond. But if, yeah, for example, in a situation where your white blood cell count is low, red blood cell count is low, platelets are low, then reticulocyte count is also low, it would mean that there is a problem with the bone marrow synthesis. And then here is another picture to just show you the different types of interleukins that are used in the process. I just want to focus predominantly on the synthesis of the red blood cells, things like your interleukin 6, interleukin uh, 11, your, and eventually these are going to be forming these uh, colony forming units, or which are eventually going to give rise to the red blood cells through this entire process. And here are just some of the pathological different types of things that you may see in microcytic hypochromic anemia, which will focus a lot in this lecture, the sickle cell anemia, the megaloblastic anemia, erythroblastosis fetalis, that's how they appear like. So remember that, like I say, there are going to be changes that are happening to the cell as it's moving through the different stages. So one change is that there's going to be a change in the color of the cytoplasm because of the appearance of hemoglobin. Remember, the normal blast will progressively begin to synthesize hemoglobin and to progressively begin to fill up the cytoplasm. So it changes color from it being the pale blue, then eventually it's going to be, become a mixture of blue, together with some pink, and then eventually it will become nice and pink. The nucleus is also supposed to condense, and then it's supposed to be extruded and removed from the cell. In addition to this, you're going to be having the cells becoming smaller and smaller with each and every single division, such that if you don't have any raw material, for example, you don't have iron to synthesize the hemoglobin, the, the cell cannot go any further division. And uh, rather, the cell will go in extra division, not, not what I just said, it will go in extra division such that it utilizes or maintains the little hemoglobin that is there to keep the cell nice and pink and to keep the hemoglobin concentration to a certain level within the cells. So remember also that 
once this nucleus has been extruded from the cell you have this reticular uh, reticulocyte stage and it has some ribosomes and it has the ability to synthesize some hemoglobin then eventually in about one to two days it matures into a mature red blood cell and remember that the entire process takes about seven days so if you get one single pronomoblast it's going to give rise to 16 mature red blood cells and the normal reticulocyte count which i did point to earlier on is one percent so there is a change in the size a reduction in the size and of course there's change in the color from basophilic to a mixture of eosinophilic and basophilic to of course completely eosinophilic and this process is going to need iron it's going to need vitamin b12 it's going to need vitamin b8 which is our folic acid so remember that there is a feedback loop that pretty much regulates this process if someone has a lot of red blood cells there will be a feedback loop such that you don't produce a lot of erythropoietin and the, um, the little erythropoietin that is produced is largely going to be bound to those many red blood cells and you're not going to be stimulating the process of erythropoiesis but if you have very little circulating amounts of red blood cells it means that though you have a lot of free erythropoietin which can non stimulate the process of erythropoiesis it can also stimulate the release of reticulocytes and the maturation of reticulocytes one such important key regulator protein is known as hepcidin which is going to be produced from the liver now this hepcidin is going to be controlling the absorption of iron it's going to be controlling the release of iron from the reticular endothelial tissues so it is what is actually implicated in anemia of chronic disease because you generally want to hide away the iron from the bloodstream because the assumption here is that for example if you have a bacteria infection they tend to feed on iron so the hepcidin is going to decrease the absorption from the gut it's going to decrease the release of iron from the reticular endothelial system so it's also another acute phase reactant protein which is a key regulator in the metabolism of iron and has been implicated in the pathophysiology of anemia of chronic disease so what exactly is anemia now that we've had a general overview of the background information that you need to know so remember that this is a decrease in the red cell mass as well as the hemoglobin below the reference level for the age sex pregnancy state of an individual that's going to result in a reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity so remember that women of childbearing age generally have values less than 10 percent lower than the male counterparts and so it means that anemia is going to be defined as a hematocrit that's less than 10 percent below the mean value of the age the sex and the attitude so here are some factors or rather numbers that you want i want you guys to remember so with the red blood cell count in women less than 4 million in men less than 4.5 million in women in hb less than 12 is considered as anemia in men less than 13.5 though some literature actually quotes 14. in women less than 37 percent hematocrit in men less than 40 though some literature also quote 42 percent so remember that from the age of two to puberty anything that's less than 11 grams per deciliter is going to be considered as anemia and if it's in a newborn if they have a hemoglobin that's actually 14 this is going to be the lower limit anything less than 14 is going to be considered as anemic and what you really need to worry about is remember that blood we say that consists of two components a formed elements as well as plasma so it means also the amount of volume of plasma is greatly going to affect the concentration of the hemoglobin is going to affect the red blood cell concentration so what do i mean if for example you have alterations in the total circulating plasma while well, as you keep the concentration of the red blood cells and the hemoglobin the same they will either reduce or increase what do i mean if you are reducing the plasma volume it means that now for example in patients that are dehydrated it means that this person is going to be having their blood becoming concentrated this is what is known as hemoconcentration so this tends to mask uh, features of anemia or even sometimes it may be some pseudo type of uh, poly it may cause a pseudo type of polycythemia where you think like as if this person has very high hb but this is because their plasma volume has generally reduced this is also very common in hemoconcentration that we see often in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy then on the other end of the spectrum if you gain a lot of plasma without increasing the red blood cell mass or the hemoglobin for example someone has a splenomegaly or someone has a pregnancy this may actually lead to anemia because the total circulating red cell uh, concentration as well as hemoglobin has reduced 
relative to the volume that is there. But what this person has, they didn't have any changes in the red blood cell number. They didn't have any changes in the hemoglobin initially. The only thing that was changed is the plasma. So it means that after an acute major blood loss, anemia may actually not even be immediately apparent until now the total blood volume has been reduced and you get those compensatory mechanisms have finally balanced out the fluid distribution balance in this person such that now it may take up to a day for the plasma volume to be replaced and for you to actually gauge the degree of anemia and for it to become apparent. And remember that regeneration of hemoglobin will take a substantially longer period than will the replacement of the plasma component. So the initial clinical features of the major blood loss are therefore going to be as a result of a reduction in the blood volume rather than anemia. The features of anemia tend to arise a bit later on. So what's our approach to anemia? Generally, remember this is a pathophysiological condition and it's going to be resulting from either an underproduction, an increase in destruction, which could be hemolysis, blood loss or bleeding, or a combination of the three things. So what do we want to do on our history? We want to obtain a thorough history for us to determine the cause. Geographic location is very important. You should consider some parasites like schistosomiasis, malaria, then the presenting symptoms generally will depend on the acuteness and the severity of the condition. Also, it will depend on the age of the patient and how long they've had this anemia, the presence of any underlying diseases. Generally, symptoms can occur when the anemia is chronic, but most patients are often asymptomatic and it's just discovered incidentally. You may sometimes get some nonspecific symptoms like lightheadedness, dizziness, a throbbing headache, history of syncope, tinnitus, which is this ringing sound in the ears. You may get fatigue, palpitations, chest pain or angina, exercise and cold intolerance, difficulties in breathing, intermittent claudication, which is this pain that they feel in their calf muscles, especially when they're walking because there's a lot of hypoxia that's happening there because it's a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Then you may sometimes have ankle swelling, some visual disturbances because of retinal hemorrhage. Other symptoms may include anorexia, indigestion, nausea, bowel irregularity. This is often due to shunting of blood from the splanchnic bed. You may get irritability, difficulty in concentration, worsening dementia, menstrual irregularities. You may sometimes get impotence and decrease in libido. All these are non-specific uh, features. So these, you should have some index of suspicion that a patient may be anemic if they present with some of these symptoms. Then you also want to be interested in their past medical, surgical, and drug history if they've had any history of similar illness in the past, any other underlying diseases that you want to know of, any exposure to certain drugs and toxins such as methyl dopa, any family history of anemia. You're also interested if it's a female of reproductive age, even if it's a female that's uh, menopausal or postmenopausal, you're interested in their pregnancies. Have they had multiple pregnancies? Excuse me. Have they had any grand multiparity? What's their menstrual history like? Do they have excessive menstrual bleeding? Do they have any postmenopausal bleeding? Do they have any prolonged menses? That's if they have reached menopause and they're no longer having their menses. You want to ask if they have any uh, postmenopausal bleeding because this bleeding could lead them to anemia. It could be a carcinoma of the cervix. Then of course you want to take our nutritional history, our diet, the amount of food that they take, the quality and the frequency of their meals. When you examine this patient, you want to do a thorough or comprehensive examination. You may see pallor of the mucous membranes. Sometimes there may be bleeding sites that you identify. There may be signs of hyperdynamic circulation. Things like tachycardia, a bounding pulse, cardiomegaly, a systolic flow murmur or what we call a hemic murmur. Then you may have features of heart failure like an S3 heart sound, as well as orthostatic hypotension. Then there are certain specific features that are usually tied in to certain specific types of anemia. You may get, for example, coelonychia or spoon-shaped nails. I'll show you what they look like. Angular stomatitis. I'll show you what it looks like. Glossitis, which may indicate iron deficiency. Glossitis indicates folate deficiency. You may sometimes get a vitamin B12 deficiency causing glossitis or neurologic abnormalities like these peripheral neuropathies, the pins and needles, the so-called subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. You may sometimes get hemolytic anemias presenting with jaundice, thalassemias presenting with bone deformities, sickle cell disease presenting with leg ulcers, and of course bleeding disorders presenting with splenomegaly, petechia, or purpura. How exactly do we classify anemia? It's based on the etiology. 
it's based on the severity, it's also based on the red cell size. All these are just general principles that do apply to all the types of anemia, so I just want us to discuss these before we actually dive into specifically talking about iron deficiency anemia. So according to the etiology, it may be due to a decrease in the production or impaired RBC production, it may be due to an increase in destruction, or it may be due to bleeding or blood loss, or a mixture of the three. So things that can cause a decrease in production, it could be nutritional deficiency, iron deficiency, very common in our setting, vitamin B12, not so common, but I've seen some isolated cases, folic acid deficiency, not so common, bone marrow suppression, it could be infections which are very common, HIV, TB, malaria, schistosomiasis, hookworm infestations, you may sometimes have hepatitis, drugs like isoniazide, chloramphenicol, alcohol, zidovudine, 5 leucytosine, hydroxyurea. It may be chronic disease such as renal and liver disease, rheumatological diseases, hypothyroidism. It may be some hemoglobinopathies such as thalassemias and myelodysplastic syndromes. Then things that may increase destruction or loss may be blood, blood loss from an acute or chronic GI bleeding, very common, menstrual bleeding, very common, trauma. It may be due to hemolysis, which can be divided as hereditary, hemolytic types of anemias, or acquired. With the hereditary types, think it could be problems with the hemoglobin. We call these hemoglobinopathies, like sickle cell disease, thalassemias. It could be a problem with enzyme, enzymes in the red blood cells, which we call enzymopathies. A glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, a pyruvate kinase deficiency. It could be problems with the membrane. We call these as membranopathies, such as hereditary spherocytosis and hereditary elliptocytosis. In other cases, it may be some acquired causes, like microangiopathic hemolytic anemias in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome in disseminated intravascular coagulation, eclampsia HELP syndrome, which stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. It's often associated with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. It could be these autoimmune hemolytic anemias, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, hypersplenisms, and infections like malaria. Now, how do we classify anemia based on the severity? I've put you a nice table here. Generally, I want to focus on adults because this is a lecture that's going to be with adults, the non-pregnant adults, so non-pregnant women as well as men. So with the women, generally HP greater than 12, with, with men, HP greater than 13.5. So in the women, if it's between 11 to 11.9, mild anemia, 8 to 10.9, moderate, less than 8 is considered as a severe anemia. If it's males, uh, between 11 to 12.9, mild, 8 to 10.9, moderate, less than 8, severe. This is extracted from the WHO classification according to severity. Of course, you may pause the video at this moment, capture these values. They may be helpful for the other different types of populations. Then based on the size, this is generally a very good indicator of the etiology. And we like to actually teach anemia based on this particular classification, it's very easy to actually work out. So we use the mean corpuscular volume or the MCV. So the normal MCV is between 80 to 96 femtoliters. So anyone that has less than 80 femtoliters, we say that they're microcytic anemia. Anyone that has between 80 to 96, we say that they have normocytic anemia. Anyone with greater than 96 femtoliters, we say that they have macrocytic anemia. There are specific causes of microcytic anemia, there are specific causes of normocytic anemia, there are specific causes of macrocytic anemia. So here are the three different types. We have the small cells, which are known as the microcytes, where you have uh, less than 80 femtoliters. Four important causes I want you to remember. Iron deficiency, thalassemias, anemia of chronic disease, sideroblastic anemia. Remember here the problem is hemoglobin, the synthesis of hemoglobin. Then here we have the large cells which are known as the macrocytes which could either be uh, associated with megaloblastic cells or associated with normoblastic cells. So with megaloblastic cells with vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency, all these are lectures on their own, as well as the normoblastic which may be due to alcohol, it may be due to reticulocytes which for example in hemolysis or hemorrhage, it may be due to liver disease, it may be due to hypothyroidism, it may be due to certain drugs like azathioprine. 
then you have the normal sized uh, cells which have a normal MCV so these ones are going to be things like acute blood loss anemia of chronic disease in the early stages chronic kidney disease autoimmune rheumatic disease you may also have marrow infiltration or fibrosis you may have endocrine disease you may also have hemolytic anemias so now we want to go into microcytic anemia with the focus largely being on iron deficiency. So remember here the problem is hemoglobin. So remember hemoglobin is a protein that's going to be consisting of heme together with the globin chain. So the heme is going to be consisting of iron together with protoporphyrin. So sometimes it's a problem with iron. When can iron be the problem? If you have iron deficiency, they're not either, they're not taking enough iron, they don't have enough iron in their diet, they're not absorbing iron or they're losing iron from their diet. Or it could be a chronic anemia of chronic disease in the late stage, maybe a chronic inflammation or a malignancy. Because remember, you're producing this hepcidin, which tends to hide away iron so that you don't actually utilize, the bacteria don't actually utilize this iron. Then sometimes it could be a problem with the synthesis of the, the protoporphyrin ring. We call that as a sideroblastic anemia. Again, it's another topic for another day. That's the third cause of microcytic anemia. Then the fourth cause, it may be a problem with the globin chains. It could either be affecting the alpha chains or the beta chains. We call this as thalassemias. So those are the four main causes of iron, or rather microcytic anemia. We have iron deficiency, anemia of chronic disease, sideroblastic anemia, and thalassemias. And how I want you to think about it is like this. Because now you don't have these raw materials to make hemoglobin, the amount of hemoglobin in the cell is less. So it means these cells are going to be undergoing an extra division to maintain the hemoglobin concentration, to keep them nice and pink. So it means these cells are going to be smaller than they are, and they're going to be less pink than they are supposed to be. So remember that iron deficiency is the most common type of anemia worldwide, which is why I decided to actually start discussing this type of anemia on my channel as we introduce the anemias to the channel. It's going to arise as a result of either inadequate intake of iron. This is very common in infants. It's very common in adolescents. It's very common in pregnant women. It may be due to malabsorption, which, for example, it could be in the background of a celiac disease. It may be due to chronic bleeding, including heavy menses or bleeding from the GIT, such as tumors. You should suspect this, especially in middle-aged or old people. You should think of things like carcinoma of the colon. Remember that iron deficiency is going to be occurring when you use up the body stores and they become inadequate for the normal red blood cell synthesis. And it's going to be due to a decrease in the levels of iron. Then this decreased levels of iron leads to a decrease in the production of heme, eventually a decrease in the production of hemoglobin. And this is going to result in a microcytic type of anemia. And the key thing that I want you to take from this lecture is that iron deficiency itself is not a complete diagnosis. It's always secondary to something. So you can't say someone just has iron deficiency anemia and end there. They must always be a secondary thing. So it's often a manifestation of a disease and it's not a complete diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about iron metabolism because it will help you now understand how iron deficiency can come about and generally how we're going to be managing these patients. Remember that iron, which is abbreviated or has a chemical symbol Fe, is generally a component that we're going to be finding in hemoglobin, we find it in myoglobin, we find it in many enzymes. It's very necessary for the maintenance of healthy cells, the maintenance of the skin, the hairs, and the nails. This is very important because if you get someone having iron deficiency, it means you should expect some changes in the skin, you should expect some changes with the hair, you should expect some changes with the nails. So it can, iron itself can exist in two main forms. It can exist as heme iron, which is found in the animal products. It can also exist as non-heme iron, which is found in the plants and the grains. More than 85% of the iron that we get in the average diet is coming from non-heme sources. And remember that the absorption of non-heme is going to be harder than the absorption of heme. So it's easier to absorb heme than non-heme, which brings me to the third point, is that remember that when you get a vegetarian, someone that doesn't eat any meat at all, they are more likely to develop iron deficiency because again, absorption of heme is much harder than the absorption of, uh, rather the absorption of non-heme is much harder than the absorption of heme. 
Remember the absorption of non-heme can be increased by consuming animal proteins. It can also be increased by vitamin C. So the amount of iron that can actually be absorbed in the diet can increase up to five times if the body stores are actually depleted. And remember that iron is going to be cons consumed as heme, like we already said, the meat-derived products, and non-heme, including vegetable-derived products, cereals that are fortified with iron. The reason why non-heme is not so easy to absorb is because of the state of the iron that is found in this non-heme. Remember, iron can exist in two states. It can exist in the ferrous state, which is Fe2+, easy to absorb. That's the type of iron that we often find in the heme part or the heme derivatives. Then the ferric form, which is Fe3+, plus, is the one that's going to be found in non-heme. So Fe3 has to be converted to Fe2. And remember that this is going to be facilitated by the acid in the stomach. So this, the acid in the stomach actually causes a reduction of the ferrous iron into the ferric form. And remember the ferrous iron is much more easier to absorb than the ferric form. And of course, vitamin C or ascorbic acid also does help with this, as well as other citrates. So it means in someone who's a vegan and you want to give them this supplemental iron, you want to avoid and they want to avoid any animal products, you should advise them to also be taking it with vitamin C because this will help with the absorption. And then remember that iron is going to be distributed in the as an active metabolite and into the storage pools. And generally the total body iron is about three to five grams in a healthy male and about 2.5 grams in women. And the difference is because number one, women generally have smaller bodies than men. And number two, you also get a decrease in the iron stores in women because of the menses that they have each and every month, especially if they are of reproductive age. And the iron is going to be distributed as follows. Hemoglobin will have about two grams in men, 1.5 grams in women. Ferritin, which is one of the storage forms of iron, one gram in men, 0 0.6 in women. Hemosiderin, which is another storage form, about 300 milligrams. Myoglobin will have about 200 milligrams. Tissue enzymes, he, both heme and non-heme tissue enzymes, 150 milligrams. And the transport iron component is about 3 milligrams. So coming to a total of 3.5 grams in men and 2.5 grams in women. Now remember that an average diet is going to be consisting of about 6 milligrams of elemental iron per thousand kilocalories and this is actually adequate to maintain iron homeostasis so generally individuals take in about 10 to 30 milligrams of iron in a day with an average of about 15 milligrams of iron per day and funny thing enough only 5 to 10 percent of this is actually absorbed so it comes down to about one milligram only about one milligram out of the same 15 milligrams per day is going to be absorbed into the bloodstream and this is just to match the amount of iron that is lost and we lose about one milligram per day and this is lost through disquamation of the skin is lost from the intestines if it's in the males males lose very little amount of iron while as females can lose this iron through the menses but males lose very little amounts of iron remember that the absorption may be increased to about 20 to 30 percent in iron deficiency as well as in pregnancy and Iron is going to be regulated by a key iron regulator, which is a protein that is synthesized from the liver that's known as hepcidin, which tends to suppress the absorption of iron, and it also tends to suppress the release of iron from the reticular endothelial system. Then remember that abs absorption of iron is going to rarely go beyond 6 milligrams per day, unless if you have some supplemental iron that you're giving. And generally, children have a greater need for iron and they appear to absorb more iron to meet this demand. Iron is going to be absorbed both from the duodenum and the upper jejunum. Heme iron is going to be absorbed from the duodenum, while as the non-heme iron is going to be absorbed from the proximal jejunum. And the heme iron, which is coming from animal derivatives like meat products, is going to be more readily absorbed than the non-heme. And remember that the dietary non-heme is going to be found in the ferric form and it must be reduced to the ferrous form. I already talked about this. And the non-heme products is going to be reduced uh, by other foods like absorption of these non-heme products is going to be reduced by other things like milk, vegetable, fiber, phytates. You may also have polyphenols, tea tannates such as phosphoproteins, bran, certain antibiotics like tetracyclines. All these things are going to reduce the absorption of non-heme products. While ascorbic acid and citrates have been known to increase the absorption of non-heme iron. So 
because the nadhim iron is poorly absorbed from the diet most people actually are going to barely meet the requirements for iron in their body but if you get someone who's typically on a typical western diet it's unlikely for them to develop an iron deficiency anemia if the only reason is because as a result of dietary deficiency but if they have some modest losses or increased requirements or some iatrogenic phlebotomy where you're drawing some blood or you have decreased caloric intake these can contribute to iron deficiency so how is this iron absorbed so the enterocytes have two important proteins they have a heme protein which is known as the heme carrier protein one and they have a non-heme protein which is known as the divalent metal transporter one which is pretty much going to be readily absorbing this heme and non-heme iron and then remember that the heme form is readily absorbed and it has to be kept in the reduced state by the stomach acid so in the ferrous state as opposed to the ferric state then you may get things like phosphates oxalates tannates in tea pyrates which are found in plant food which may decrease the absorption of iron then once the iron has now been taken into the enterocytes it's going to be now crossing the membrane and entering into the bloodstream via channel protein that's known as ferroportin then after this this iron is going to bind to transferrin and it is this transferrin that's going to deliver this iron to the liver it's going to deliver the iron to the bone marrow macrophages for the purpose of storage and as well as uh, for the purposes of erythropoiesis so remember the iron that's coming from the intestinal mucosa is going to be transferred to a protein that's known as transferrin this is an ion transportation protein that's made by the liver. And then this transferrin is going to be transferring the ion from the cells of the intestines, from the uh, macrophages to specific receptors that are found, or specific cells like the erythroblasts, the placenta cells, and the liver cells that need this ion either for the purpose of erythropoiesis or for the purpose of storage. Then for the heme synthesis to happen, the ion has to be transported to the erythroblast mitochondria and then in the mitochondria the iron is added to the protoporphyrin uh, 9 ring to become heme and remember as long as we don't have this protoporphyrin ring in sideroblastic anemia the iron will remain trapped in the mitochondria so that's what happens in sideroblastic anemia where you fail to synthesize this protoporphyrin ring because of deficiency of certain enzymes like amino levolunic acid synthetase and amino levolunic acid dehydrogenase so the iron remains trapped in the mitochondria you form this nice bluish ring when you stain them with prussian blue in sideroblastic anemia but we'll talk about that in a different video so the transferrin which has a half-life of eight days is then extruded for reutilization and then of course the synthesis of transferrin is going to increase when the iron, there's iron deficiency because transferrin is a molecule that is transferring iron. If the body deems that you don't have enough iron, it will make a lot of molecules to go and transport the iron. I think of it like this. If you're broke, you're going to find means and ways to go make money. You're going to start looking for a job. So you're going to go job hunting. So you can think of the transferrin as means to maximize the little iron that you can absorb from the gut. And then, of course, it's decreased in anemia of chronic disease because of the hepcidin. Then remember that the iron that's not going to be used for the purpose of erythropoiesis is going to be stored in two main forms. It's going to be stored in as ferritin, which is this heterogeneous group of proteins that are going to be surrounding an iron core. This type of storage is soluble, and this is the active storage fraction that's going to be located in the hepatocytes of the liver, in the bone marrow, in the macrophages of the spleen. It's also found in the red blood cells as well as in the serum. Remember, ferritin is the storage form of iron and you can reuse this iron. That's the goodness. So this one is readily available from any for any body requirement and the circulating serum ferritin is running parallel and close together with the body store. So we can actually use the serum ferritin to gauge how much is present in the body stores. So one nanogram per mil of ferritin is going to be equal to eight milligrams of iron in the storage pool. Then the hemosiderin is pretty much relatively insoluble. It's going to be found primarily in the liver, the Kupfer cells of the liver, and in the bone marrow, the macrophages of the bone marrow. It's not easily mobilized for red blood cell synthesis, and it's this insoluble iron protein complex that is found in the macrophages in the bone marrow, in the liver, and in the spleen. And it may actually be uh, quite visible on the light microscopy in certain tissue sections and even in bone marrow films after staining with the Perl's reaction. Remember that 
stored intracellular iron is going to be bound to ferritin, which prevents the iron from forming free, reaction, free radicals uh, in the Fenton reaction. And about two thirds of iron is stored as ferritin, one third is stored as hemosiderin. Then remember that because this iron is abs absorption is limited, the body tends to recycle this iron and to conserve the iron. So it's very easy, especially in males, to have iron overload. Even in patients that have these repetitive transfusions, it's very easy for them to have iron overload because males have very little mechanisms to how they get rid of iron. So remember that the transferrin is going to be binding and recycling the available iron from any of the aging red blood cells that are going to be undergoing phagocytosis by the mononuclear phagocytes. And this mechanism is actually results in recycling of about 90 to 95% of the daily iron that is needed. So remember that iron deficiency is going to be happening in stages. In the initial stages, the iron requirements are going to be exceeding the intake or the available iron. And this is going to now cause a progressive depletion of the bone marrow iron stores. Think of it like this. When you get fired from your job, you start using the money that you have in your pocket. That gets used up. You go to your bank, use the money that's in your bank, then that gets used up. Then you start to look for a job. Same thing is happening here. The demands for iron have increased, but you're not getting this extra iron. So you're progressively depleting the iron in the bloodstream. Then you progressively deplete the iron in the bone marrow. Then after that, you're going to, as the stores now are, are, are decreased, the absorption of iron will be increased to compensate. So you, you now go look for more iron. Even now, the proteins that are meant to bind to iron, like transferrin, are going to increase. So it means the total iron binding capacity of the body is going to increase. Then during the later stages, then you have this deficiency that's going to be still there, that's going to impair the red blood cell synthesis. Ultimately, this will cause anemia. Then, of course, with severe and prolonged iron deficiency, this may also cause dysfunction of certain iron-containing cellular enzymes. The stages, you're going to first deplete the storage iron. So the, there's a decrease in ferritin. There's an increase in the total iron binding capacity. The serum ion is also going to be depleted. So there's a decrease in the serum ion and there's a decrease in iron saturation. The proteins that are bound to iron in the bloodstream, there'll be less iron. So less of these proteins will be bound. Then, of course, you get a an area where there's a normocytic anemia where the bone marrow makes fewer but normal sized red blood cells so the, because there's this iron deficient erythropoiesis then eventually the bone marrow is going to be making this microcytic and hypochromic cells now what can cause iron deficiency and these are the things that you really want to investigate a patient for when they present with iron deficiency so it may be due to an increase in the demands of their requirements it's very common between birth and the age of two, as well as during adolescence and pregnancy. So it's common in prematurity in newborns. It's common, especially in adolescence, when they have this rapid growth and they hit the growth spurt. It's common in pregnancy because the fetus actually, the fetal requirements increase the maternal requirements for iron. It's also common during lactation. It could be due to poor diet. Remember, infants that are breastfed versus those that are bottle fed are going to be iron deficient because human milk has very little amounts of iron, especially if the complementary feeds are delayed to be introduced. You may also have children that have poor diets. Other causes include malnutrition, malabsorptive syndromes like celiac disease, someone undergoing a partial gastrectomy. Because once you're removing part of the stomach, this is going to be meaning that there's less acid that is present. And if there's less acid that is present, remember the iron, the ferrous iron can no longer be kept in the ferrous form, but it then converts into the ferric form, which is a bit harder to absorb. Then, of course, if this patient is also taking some antiacids, which may reduce the amount of acid in their stomach. Then, of course, it may be due to decreased absorption, gastrectomy, which I've just explained, or malabsorptive syndromes like celiac disease, a atrophic glossitis, helicobacter pylori infection, which may cause ulcers, which may lead to treatment with these antiacids. You may also have achloridia, short bowel syndrome, and really it may be iron refractory and iron deficiency anemia, and sometimes rarely absorption is decreased by dietary deprivations, for example, in undernutrition, although undernutrition and malnutrition is common in our setting here. Then you may have some chronic bleeding. This, in adults between 20 to 50, you should think about peptic ulcer disease in males. Think about menorrhagia in females. Remember, a female loses about 0.5 milligrams of iron per day. This is a main 
average. And then of course, in pregnant women and those that have vascular ectasia, you may have some GIT losses, which are due to esophageal varices, which may be bleeding, hiatal hernias, pe uh, peptic ulcer disease, aspirin ingestion, which may cause ulcers, carcinomas of the stomach, carcinomas of the cecum, carcinomas of the colon, carcinomas of the rectum, much more common in the older age group. You may sometimes have hookworms, two important hookworms to know, ankylostoma duodenale and anacata americanus. It may be due to cystosomiasis, it may be due to colitis, the ulcerative colitis of Crohn's disease. They may present you with chronic hemorrhage. It may be due to hemorrhoids or piles. It may be due to diverticulosis. Rarely, it may be due to hematuria, urinating blood, hemoglobinuria, where you're passing this hemoglobin in the urine. It may be due to pulmonary hemosiderosis. It may sometimes be self-inflicted blood loss. So make sure that you do investigate this patient and have a thorough history to target these important causes. The clinical features are generally insidious and it's progressive. You have those non-specific features that we mentioned earlier on, the fatigue, the syncope, the loss of stamina, shortness of breath, weakness, dizziness, headaches, pallor, lightheadedness, tinnitus, the tachycardias, the palpitations. You may have another common symptom that's known as restless leg syndrome where they get this unpleasant urge to move the legs during a period of inactivity. Then there are some specific symptoms that are quite specific to iron deficiency anemia. So you may have pica, where they crave these unusual substances. For example, you may have uh, geophagia, where they crave to eat soil. Some people may crave to eat ice. Some may crave to eat glass. These things that have non-nutritional value. And then you may also have brittle nails. Remember, iron is needed for the nails. You may have spoon-shaped nails, which is what we refer to as coelonychia. I added some pictures very shortly. Then you may sometimes have atrophy of the papillae. You call this as atrophic lositis. I'll show you what all these look like. You may have brittle hair. You may have angular stomatitis. You may have chelitis. You may sometimes have a syndrome that's known as a Ploma Vincent syndrome. It's also referred to as Patson Kelly syndrome, where you have iron deficiency anemia. You have an esophageal web, which may present with dysphagia and you have atrophic glossitis, a beefy red tongue. So you see these three things, your diagnosis is Pluma Vincent syndrome. This is what our angular stomatitis looks like, this sores at the corner of the mouth and inflammation of the lips, which is our chelitis. Then we have our spoon-shaped nails, which is our coelonychia here on the right. Then you have this atrophic glossitis. The tongue is supposed to normally have these papillae, these small dots, that you can even feel. But as you can see, this appears smooth like the tongue of a cow. So this is a beefy red tongue or atrophic glossitis. So remember that the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia is going to rely on the clinical history. So you must take a proper history of the diet. You must take a history of any medications like self-medications with NSAIDs, which put the patient at risk of GIT bleeding. You must also have the presence of blood in the feces, maybe a sign of hemorrhoids or maybe a sign of carcinoma of the bowel. Then in women, you must have a very good obstetric and gynecological history, the duration of the periods, the occurrence of any clots, the number of sanitary towels or tampons that they use. Normally, they must have about three to five and they shouldn't change more than three that are heavily soaked for you to make a diagnosis. Now, what investigations are we largely going to do? So generally, a full blood count is going to be your first thing when you see that a patient has these features of anemia. A full blood count, you're looking at the MCV, which will be decreased. You're looking at the MCH, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin, and the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. The MCH and the MCHC may be reduced. The reticulocyte count is often low in iron deficiency anemia. So the diagnosis is going to be an MCV that's less than 80, then an MCH and an MCHC that is reduced. Then after you see this, then you're in, your, in the back of your mind, you're thinking this is a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Remember those four things that we talked about that may cause microcytic hypochromic anemia. It may be either due to iron deficiency, it may be due to thalassemias, it may be due to anemia of chronic disease, it may be due to sideroblastic anemia. Your next step now will be to take a peripheral smear. So when you do your peripheral smear, you may see these hypochromic red blood cells. You may see different types of shapes. We call this as poikilocytosis. You may see different types of sizes. We call this as anisocytosis. If you combine the two, it's known as anisopoikilocytosis. You may sometimes see target cells, which I'll show you what they look like. Then once you see this, then your diagnosis is becoming 
much, much more closer to iron deficiency. Then you want to do our iron studies. So the iron studies are going to be pretty much looking at the serum iron, which is the amount of iron in the blood, normally between 11 to 27 millimoles per liter. You also want to look at the total iron binding capacity, which is roughly a measure of how many transferring molecules you have in the blood. Remember, each of these transferring molecules binds to about two atoms of ferric iron. Then you also want to check your percentage saturation, which is the percentage of the transferring molecules that are bound to the iron. Normally, if you have three transferring molecules, two or one of them is bound, so it's normally about 33%. Then our serum ferritin, which is going to be reflecting the ion storage in the macrophages and the liver because it's running parallel. Remember, one nanogram per mil is going to be equals to eight milligrams of iron that is stored in the body. So generally, this is what's going to happen. Remember, this person has an iron deficiency. They are using up the iron. So it means the levels of iron in the blood will be low. So the serum iron will be decreased. If you use up the levels in the blood, what's the next best thing? Go for the stores. You use up the stores. So the levels of ferritin will be low. What does the body think? You don't have enough iron. And indeed, you don't have enough iron. So it starts to make proteins that are meant to bind and transport iron. So it starts to make more transferring molecules. And this is now going to increase the total iron binding capacity. Then remember, because you already don't have iron in the body and you're making more proteins to transport iron that you don't have, the percentage saturation is going to be decreased. It's often less than 19%. You may also do our increased free erythrocyte protoporphyrin. Then it tends to increase in the early phases of iron deficiency. It tends to increase in lead poisoning, sideroblastic anemia, as well as in erythropoietic porphyrias. So here are the normal values of the iron studies in terms of iron total iron binding capacity, the ferritin, and the transferrin saturation. You may take some time, pause the video, get a screenshot of this. This will help you, especially when you're investigating your patients. And this is a comparison between the other types of the iron deficiency, or between iron deficiency, sideroblastic anemia, and anemia or chronic disease based on the different characteristic findings that you may actually get. This is a very self-explanatory table, so you may actually pause the video, get a screenshot, and if you still don't understand, post your questions in the comment section below and we will address your concerns. Then other investigations are going to be aimed at establishing the underlying cause, so you want to do a stool for occult blood if there's any bleeding, which is also referred to as a GOAC test. You may also want to take stool for ovine parasites as in terms of a parasitic and hookworm infestation. It's just x-ray to rule out any pulmonary hemosiderosis, a urinalysis to rule out any hematuria or hemosidinuria, a pelvic ultrasound to rule out any gynecological problems, upper and lower GIT radiological studies and endoscopic studies to rule out any upper or lower GIT bleeding, a bronchoscopy to rule out any bleeding into the respiratory tract. This is what target cells look like. They look like a target. So as you can see, there's this central red, uh, pinkish area, then you have a halo that is surrounding in the peripheral pinkish area. So this is known as a target cells. And this here, you have poikilocytosis, different types of shapes. Then remember that if the tests actually have excluded iron deficiency in a patient that has microcytic anemia, your next best thing to investigate this patient for is anemia of chronic disease. Start to look for any chronic inflammatory disease, start to look for a malignancy. If these come out normal, start to think of structural abnormalities of hemoglobin, hemoglobinopathies. Start to investigate this patient for anemia, I mean sickle cell anemia, start to investigate this patient for any thalassemias. So you may want to do your HB electrophoresis. You may also want to do some genetic testing for the alpha thalassemias. Remember the different stages we talked about earlier on. So stage one, there's going to be a decrease in the bone marrow iron stores. There's, uh, the hemoglobin and the serum ion are going to remain normal, but the serum ferritin is going to be falling less than 30 nanograms per mil. Then, of course, there's going to be some compensatory increase in the uh, ion absorption, which causes an increase in the ion binding capacity, so an increase in the transferring levels. Then in stage 2, the erythropoiesis is impaired, so even though the transferring levels are increased, the ion in the serum is reduced, and the transferring saturation is also reduced. So erythropoiesis tends to be impaired when the serum ion falls to less than 50 micrograms per deciliter or less than 9 micromoles per liter and the transferring saturation to less than 
then of course the, tra the serum transferring receptor level is going to rise to greater than 8.5 milligrams per liter. Then in stage 3, that's where you get anemia, but then the bone marrow will still be putting out these normal sized red blood cells and the normal indices will be there. Then in stage 4, then they become microcytic, they become small and they become hypochromic as well. Then in the fifth stage, then the iron deficiency starts, starts to affect the tissues. Then you also have these resulting symptoms and signs of iron deficiency. Now, how do we manage the last and final thing? So remember that this is going to be dependent on the underlying cause. It's going to be dependent on the severity of the anemia and the presence or absence of symptoms. We generally want to identify and treat the underlying cause because we can supplement as much iron as we want. But as long as we haven't addressed the underlying cause, we haven't solved the problem. We also want to replace the iron either through dietary means, for example, for those with mild and moderate, which are managed as outpatients, together with the pharmacological medicines that are going to be given to supplement the iron. In some cases, we may want to offer a blood transfusion. There are certain specific indications, and we often want to give this patient packed red blood cells or red blood cell concentrates, as opposed to whole blood. Then generally, if it's a mild to moderate anemia, these are managed as outpatient, while it's the severe or those that are symptomatic with these persistent certain symptoms, these are managed as inpatients. Remember that even if the cause of iron deficiency can, if, even if the cause of iron deficiency can be still identified and treated, it's still quite necessary to supplement them with iron. It's not just enough to treat the underlying cause and then you send the patient home. You must make sure that you supplement them with iron. So remember that supplemental iron provides more iron than they would get in a multivitamin because the multivitamin often have very little concentrations of iron. If it's the, for example, the prenatal care tablets, they may consist of about 60 uh, milligrams of elemental iron, which is quite low. Then of course, until the iron deficiency is actually corrected, then the body stores are going to be replenished. In some of the cases, if the cause is not identified or corrected, we continue them on the supplemental iron as we continue to investigate this patient. So some dietary advice that you may give the patient, meat like beef, pork, lamb, especially organ meats such as liver, tend to have high concentrations of iron. Poultry such as chicken, turkey, duck, especially liver as well as duck meat, tends to have iron. Fish, especially shellfish, sardines, anchovies, are pretty much going to have iron. Leafy green vegetables such as cabbage, including broccoli, kale, or turnip greens, as well as collard greens. Legumes like uh, lima beans, peas, uh, pinto beans, as well as the black-eyed peas. Then, of course, iron-rich pastas, grains, rice, and cereals are things that you want to incorporate in their diet. Then supplemental iron is going to be given to treat iron deficiency. And remember, this is going to have higher concentrations than what we find in multivitamin supplementation. So the amount of iron is going to be prescribed in milligrams of elemental iron. And for most people with iron deficiency, they may require about 150 to 200 milligrams per day of elemental iron. So that's roughly about 2 to 5 milligrams of iron per kg body weight per day. So there is no evidence that one type of iron salt or one liquid or one pill is much superior to the other. So the amounts of elemental iron tend to vary with different preparations. So make sure you check the insert and see how much iron is actually being given to these patients. Often the pharmacists are the ones that are going to do this. Then to be sure that the amount of iron in the product is actually the one that you're looking for, we check the packaging. This is done by the pharmacy, like I said. We often want to give them vitamin C or ascorbic acid to improve the absorption of iron. So we should contemplate adding about 250 mils of vitamin C tablets with the iron tablets. So we can give iron orally or we can give it parentally. So we can start off with the oral formulation. So this one is indicated for those that have mild to moderate anemia. It's not really advisable for those with severe anemia as an initial treatment. We can only give those with severe anemia. If you have given them, for example, a blood transfusion, then we continue them on oral hematinics. Then, of course, you investigate them. So remember that iron is going to be provided by various salts like ferrous sulfate, which is common preparation in our setting. You may have ferrous uh, gluconate, you may have ferrous fumarate, which I've seen now being present even on the market. Saccharidated um, iron, which can be given 30 minutes before meals. Then food or antacids may reduce the absorption, so keep that in mind. So a typical dose of about 65 
milligrams of elemental iron, which is about 325 milligrams of ferrous sulfate, can be given once a day or every other day on alternate days. So the larger the dose of iron, remember that most of these large doses of ions are going to be unabsorbed because hepcidin is going to reduce the absorption of iron and limit the absorption of iron. And generally, there are going to be more side effects, things like constipation, GI abscess. You may have other things like nausea, dyspepsia, diarrhea, which may actually occur with higher doses of iron. Remember, we must give this with ascorbic acid, or you can give this with orange juice, which enhances the absorption of iron. If we're given ferrous sulfate, in our case, if it's an iron deficiency, then we want to give it as a 200 milligrams orally three times a day. This gives us about 180 milligrams of ferrous iron. And if they have some side effects, then we can switch them to ferrous gluconate, which is going to be roughly about 300 milligrams given twice a day, and this gives about 70 milligrams of iron. Or we can give them ferrous lactate syrup. And remember the response to treatment, you expect a daily rise of hemoglobin by about 0.1 to 0.2 grams per deciliter. So this increase in concentration of at least 2 grams per deciliter after 3 weeks is considered as a good response. And then of course the treatment should be continued for 3 months after the anemia is resolved so that you replenish the iron stores. So if someone doesn't have an adequate response this may be meaning that they may continue they may have been bleeding and they are still bleeding there may be non-compliancy it may be a wrong diagnosis there may be mixed deficiencies such as associated folic acid deficiency or associated b12 so often when we're giving the patient iron supplementation we often do also give them vitamin b12 we often do also give them folic acid such that you don't have these mixed deficiencies and another cause of anemia should be looked for, like a malignancy or an inflammation, malabsorption, though it's rare, or you want, or you're using a slow release preparation. So you must assess for all these things if there's inadequate response. Remember that the iron supplementation can even go up to six months after the correction of the hemoglobin level, so that you replenish the stores. And the iron studies should actually be rechecked at least four weeks after parenteral iron to actually ensure adequate replenishment. And of course, the response of treatment is assessed by this serial HB's measurements that you're going to be doing until the normal red blood cell values are achieved. So generally, the HB rise, uh, rises a little for two weeks, then it rises uh, for about 0 0.7 to one gram per week until the near normal where it actually, the rates actually increase and then they taper off. And remember, anemia should be corrected within two months. So generally, when we give them the treatment, the initial treatment, the therapeutic treatment should be for the first three months. Then afterwards, uh, when we're approaching six, another three months is just to replenish the stores. So generally, we can treat them for actually more than six months. So a subnormal response is going to be suggesting, like for example, I said, continued hemorrhage, underlying infections, cancers, insufficient iron that they're taking, malabsorption of the iron. And if the symptoms of anemia, such as fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, do not stop after the resolution of anemia, then you should assess this patient for an alternative diagnosis. Then in case of the parenteral iron, remember this one is going to be giving you a much more rapid response than the oral iron, but it has more side effects. And most people can have actually allergic reactions. They may have infusion reactions like fever, arthralgias, myalgias. Sometimes there may be this severe anaphylactoid reaction, which is very common with high molecular weight iron dextrin, which we no longer is no longer readily available. But generally, the preparations of parenteral iron are going to be reserved for the patients that can't really take oral formulations, for the patients whom oral iron is ineffective, for the patients who steadily lose large amounts of blood because of the capillary or vascular disorders like hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias, and patients that need uh, ex expedient uh, iron replacement because they have severe anemia or they have an elective surgery or they're in the third trimester of pregnancy. So generally, we can give iron dextrin, we can give iron sucrose, or we can give ferric uh, gluconate. In our setting here, we give iron sucrose. That's the one that we readily find available. Remember that these large doses can be given at one time using the iron dextrin, but then with iron sucrose and ferric uh, gluconate, we generally tend to spread their doses over several weeks, sometimes even several days in our setting here. And some patients do tend to have these allergic reactions. So make sure that you uh, administer a test dose before you actually give the infusion. So because you may have these allergic reactions, they're much more common with iron dextrin. Some severe effects include these allergic reactions. It may be things like urticaria or hives, 
pruritus or itching, muscle, or sometimes even some joint pains. Then remember that the dose of parenteral iron is going to be calculated based on the weight and the current hemoglobin level, but generally an initial cumulative dose of 1,000 milligrams is sufficient. So never exceed giving this person 1,000 milligrams in total. In our setting here, actually, we use a lower threshold. We use about 600 milligrams as our ceiling dose. So remember that the indication of this parenteral iron are those that are intolerant to oral iron, those with malabsorption, those that are unable or unwilling to take the oral iron. We can give them either iron dextran complex or iron sorbitol citrate or iron sucrose. This can be given intramuscular or IV. So the dose or the calculation or the formula depends on the formulation that you have. If it's iron dextran or iron sorbitol, you say 0 0.0442 multiplied by the desired Hb minus the observed or the uh, one that you have measured. You multiply that by the weight, then we add that to 0 0.26 times the weight. So if we're giving iron dextran, we generally want to give it intermittently in 5% dextrose or we give it in normal saline that's 0 0.9 percent sodium chloride we dilute about 100 to 200 milligrams in 100 mils of infusion fluid then we give 25 milligrams over 15 minutes initially then the giving rate must not exceed 6.67 milligrams per minute and a total dose infusion diluted in 500 mils infusion fluid given over four to six hours initially the with the initial dose of 25 milligrams over 15 minutes can be given the concentration of the fluid is usually 50 milligrams is equals to one mil. So one mil of the solution gives you 50 milligrams of iron. Then with iron sucrose, generally it's also given IV intermittently. We give it in uh, sodium chloride, normal saline. We dilute 100 milligrams in up to 100 mils of infusion fluid. We give the 25 milligrams over 15 minutes initially as a test dose and we shouldn't exceed a rate of 3.33 milligrams per minute. So generally the concentration of iron sucrose comes in 2%, so that's 1 mil of the fluid gives you, 1 mil of the uh, iron sucrose gives you roughly about 20 milligrams of iron. So remember that generally the dose of iron sucrose must come up cumulatively to 1,000 a, a uh, milligrams in total. So generally there are some regimens that are given, I'll give you what is the standard and then I'll give you what we do in our setting here. So generally our standard is that we give a dose, we get about 10 mils of the solution. So remember if we're getting 10 mils of the solution, that's going to equate to 200 milligrams because remember one mil gives you 20 milligrams. So this is going to equate to 200 milligrams of elemental iron. Then we dilute this in a maximum of 100 mils of 0.9% of sodium chloride. Then we give this at least over 15 minutes. Then this should be a total, the total treatment cost is about a thousand you should reach a thousand milligrams so it means that you give it on five different occasions in a period of 14 days such that this is now going to accumulate to a total of a uh, thousand milligrams so never exceed a thousand milligrams within a period of 14 days then there is some people that tend to give the 25 mils that's going to be 500 milligrams of elemental iron that's going to be given in 250 mils of normal saline and this is given over 3.5 to about four hours on day one and day 14 so they only give it twice but of course there's limited experience there's limited experience to this and this is predominantly going to be associated with a lot of side effects so the regimen that we tend to use in our setting is going to be giving 200 milligrams of the iron so that's roughly about 10 mils of the solution given in 500 mils of normal saline and we give this on alternate days and we give a maximum of three doses that's the regimen that we use in our setting then sometimes there is a need for blood transfusion so you may sometimes want to give this person red cell transfusion especially in patients that have severe iron deficiency anemia those that are actively bleeding those that have significant symptoms like chest pain shortness of breath or weakness Generally, this transfusion is meant to replace the deficient red blood cells and it's actually not going to correct the iron deficiency. Remember that the red cell transfusions are only going to provide this temporal improvement. And we generally want to give this patient packed cells as opposed to giving them whole blood because whole blood puts them at risk of overload. It puts them at risk of tipping them into heart failure. Generally, when we give whole blood, we also want to give them Lasix, that's frusamide, one milligram per kg as a stat dose. And remember, if we transfuse one unit of blood, it's going to be rising the Hb by about 1 to 1.5 milligrams per deciliter.
I really hope you enjoyed this lecture on iron deficiency. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content. Continue subscribing to the channel as we reach 8,000 subscribers to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.